that you probably do have an emergency situation on your hands. Uh, let's see now. Uh, AIM 632B, uh, after establishing radio contact, comply with the advice and instructions received. This paragraph is a very, very long paragraph. The paragraph is much more complex than the summary here appears. A very long discussion about the interaction between uh, the pilot and, and air traffic control in the event an emergency has been, has been declared. We talked earlier about the Quan Communicate Contest and Comply adage. And now we have instructions for bailout or crash landing. They would like for you to give your EOT status, visible landmarks, aircraft color, souls on board, and emergency equipment on board, like life rafts and things like that. Uh, you're supposed to ditch near a surface vessel, remain with your aircraft, and the AIM says you're supposed to land at a right angle or perpendicular to the swells in the, in the ocean. Uh, here's our transponder codes again, 75, 76, and 77. We're going to get into pre-flight planning because it's my belief that some emergencies, at least, are created by inadequate pre-flight planning. Uh, under 91103A, we're supposed to do for IFR weather, forecast, fuel requirements, alternates, and traffic delays. That's what 91103A said for IFR. For any flight, the runway links, takeoff and landing direct distance uh, in the aircraft flight manual or other reliable data on the aircraft performance. If do you have to compute your uh, runway takeoff and landing distance for every flight under 91? No, you don't. You have to be familiar with it. You have to know that 5,000 feet or 4,000 feet or 2,500 feet is adequate for your airplane. Have you got to, com to calculate a weight and balance for every flight under, under Part 91? No, you have to be familiar with it and acquainted with it. In getting your briefing, um, oh, hold on, we, we skipped something. Under AIM 511, it says pre-flight preparation consists of weather for the departure and arrival airports and en route, nav A status, no tenants, both local and distant. One thing I'm seeing in, in the crash situation is we have a crash and the pilot self-briefed. I mean, he's got, he's got all this information in his uh, GPS and he just self-briefed and we have no record of a briefing. So, in the old days, we'd get the tapes of the briefing, we'd know exactly what ATC or what the flight service station told him. Today, that may not be the case. Under AIM 511F, the information you're to provide to the briefer, the type of flight plane, whether IFR or VFR, the aircraft in number of pilots name, uh, the aircraft type, departure airport, route of flight, destination, flight altitudes, ETD and ET. Um, you know, I guess when I call in for a brief, I tell them who I am, what my tail number is, where I'm departing from, my altitude, and my time of departure. I don't typically give them my time of arrival, but maybe that's a shortcoming on my part. I think that's probably pretty common. Okay, fuel requirements. All the IFR pilots know this. Fly to your airport, do the missed approach, fly to your altitude, fly to the missed approach, and then fly for 45 minutes at normal cruising speed. The point we got into the Sabre Liner case was what is normal cruising speed? What is your fuel consumption at normal cruising speed? And he was maintaining at 45%, he had, he had 45 minutes, and uh, the Fed was saying, yeah, but 75% you don't. So your normal cruising speed is obviously going to be a function of what kind of power setting you're using. So expect this to be an, a bone of contention if you land with minimum fuel. Expect the Fed to be arguing about whether or not you have uh, the required 45 minutes of normal cruising speed in your airplane. Alan? Yeah. If you put the cruising speed on the flight plan, is that what the feds are going to say is normal cruising speed? Well, I don't know. I, I know that in the case in the case I had, we argued, we maintained that we did have 40, 45 minutes of gasoline if we came back to 45% in the jet. But I... They didn't actually argue that in the case. The case did resolve. I don't recall that being their position. But I think that's a good question. That case resolved uh, <laughs> successfully. I don't recall exactly how that turned out, but that did. I was glad to win that one because um, the problem with that case was that there was some politics in the company, and the uh, FO wanted to become the captain, and he he, he called the feds on the captain. He read them out. So uh, anyway, uh, you know these things do happen. We're leaving. But <laughs> I don't know where the FO is because I heard the captain is in California. Uh, so. um, okay, radio failure on an IFR flight plan. This is pretty obvious. If you're in VFR conditions, land as soon as possible. That's pretty simple. You know, and 
uh, I guess for the for the root is clear direct spec file, for the altitude is higher for the root segment of clear, MEA or or the altitude you're told to expect. So those are your uh, plans if your radio craps out in you and I for conditions. Let's see. Oh yeah. How many times have you been sitting uh, behind a jet on the airport, the jet takes off, and ATC says, uh, 1785 Alpha, you're clear to depart to the on the way to right. Uh, caution, wake turbulence. Happens all the time. It happens all the time to me. And and sometimes, if I'm not feeling very secure that day, I'll say, you know what, I'll, I think I'll just sit here for a minute if you don't mind. I'll, I'll just, I'll decline the clearance and take a few minutes. Because the aim calls for, I think it's three minutes. So uh, they're going to put you right behind this jet. And if there's no wind, I mean, those cortices are out there churning around, you know. You may be doing some acrobatic maneuvers in 200 feet you hadn't planned on doing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage that necessarily. It's a judgment call. But notice what the aim says. Pilots are, re are reminded that an operation is conducted behind all aircraft. Acceptance of instructions. Notice they didn't call it a clearance. Acceptance of instructions from air traffic control in the following situations is an acknowledgement that the pilot, that would be you, will ensure a safe takeoff and landing interval. So now, who's got the problem with separation? It's not ATC's problem anymore, it's yours. So be aware of that. Uh, your VFR fuel requirements, we all know that. Your destination will arri arrive at 30 minutes in the, in the daytime and 45 minutes at night. Now, one thing that came into play in that Sabre Liner case was I found this interpretation. It's, who, who knows what interpretation is? <laughs> Say? Say? Well, you can write a letter to the FAA attorneys, and you can say, Dear Mr. FAA attorney, what does the regulation mean on fuel reserve? And, and sometimes they'll write what's called an interpretation, and they will interpret the regulation. You, you may not like the answer. So be wary of what you ask for because you might get it. But anyway, uh, there's an interpretation by the FA Legal uh, it's, it's Interpretation 2005-12. And what it says is, just because you use your reserve fuel does not mean you bother the regulations. And that's what the reserve fuel is there for, to use it. Now, planning to use the reserve fuel is a different matter. If you are intentionally counting on the reserve fuel to get there, that's not a matter, but if you plan to, to arrive at your destination with your 45 minutes or at your alternate with your 45 minutes or at your hold with your 45 minutes, you're probably good. But if you plan to use it, it's a different situation because they're saying it's okay to use your reserve fuel if you did not, did not intend it or did not foresee it. That's what the agency said about that. Uh, the reason we're going to get into minimum safe altitudes here is because I see situations where pilots are creating an emergency by scud running. And remember, it's, 40, it's 500 feet above other than congested areas, no closer than 500 feet to a person, vessel, or structure, uh, no closer than, let's see, congested area 1,000 feet above the obstacle within a 2,000 foot horizontal radius. And like I said, this comes, in running, comes into play if you're scud running. So consider, you just keep inching down, and inching down, and inching down, and you're supposed to be 500 feet below. So just think about that if you're trying to make it on VFR with uh, an overcast on top of you. At, at PDK, I would argue you need to have 1,500. At Falcon Field, out of the sticks, I'd argue you need to have 1,000. Because you can fly 500 feet below the cloud base. Yeah. No. They're just concerned that, I mean, it's your problem. I mean, if you accept the clearance, you decide, if, if it's a thousand foot ceiling, you took off, take off from GDK a thousand foot ceiling. I mean, odds are no one's going to say anything about it, but if someone decides to make an issue of it, technically that's a violation because of distance from cloud criteria. I think it's 91, 151. Okay, this is a chance to talk about the unprepared emergency. There's an airliner departing out of uh, Hawaii for Germany, and dispatch calls them up on the radio and says, you don't have any standby batteries for your um, your navigation system or your internal navigation system. So the captain just decides to return to um, to return to uh, the airport. The agency truck he, he lands over Gross, 
and he is he gets a violation for 60 days for 9113 careless or reckless conduct and the case goes to trial and the judge finds the captain guilty of violating 9113a careless or reckless conduct because he landed over gross but reduces the sanction from 60 days to 15 days the case goes up on appeal and the uh, board reverses the judge and said the captain although he never used the word emergency believed he was encountering an emergency and landed for that reason that he found it. So that's it. Yes, sir. Uh, have they defined congested? Yeah. Well, let me get the aim here and see what um, part one says. I know what the interpretations are about congested areas. Consensus, it's not, it's not in the definitions of uh, FAR 1.1. We know that. A congested area, uh, the agency says that there are a cluster of houses or an open air assembly of people, like a bunch of people on the beach. As far as they're concerned, that's a congested area. That's what the agency says. Yes, sir. Well, when I was taking flight training too many years ago, supposedly congested area was where if your power systems, i.e. your engines fail, you cannot safely land without hitting people's houses, hospitals, and so forth. However, a certain local Atlanta FAA, uh, FAA inspector, who we all know, basically maintained that it's a little bit stricter um, interpretation. I know we were flying together near where I live here in Gwinnett. I easily could have landed without striking any uh, houses, and he still said that's just the area, you have to be 1,000 feet. So the FAA will be stricter than the printed regs in that case. Yeah, in, in my world, the way we address that is, is I go to the NTSB decisions, and there are, there are cases out there that address what a congested area is, and we apply that to the facts. And sometimes it's not clear whether this is a congested or, or uncongested or non-congested. And, and the case turns on, if it's an uncongested area, it is legal, but if it's a congested area, it wasn't legal. So what's your best definition based on the NTSB decision? I think if you have a subdivision or a cluster of houses or a, or a rock concert or a group of people or a NASCAR race or, or you know, just a, a group of people, I think that that's a congested area. You shouldn't fly low over. Yeah, and, well, I know, and, and that's just common sense, really, and there's no point in making a spectacle of yourself. And the sad thing I see in and Steve knows this from one of the cases I wrote about here in the last year. And there are people out there who will actually act as exhibitors. They'll actually exhibit themselves. They'll, they'll dive on a crowd and do low pass. And then they'll get angry because they get violated for doing it. I and mean, it's kind of a non sequitur. Why are you exhibiting that kind of behavior unless you want to get your tickets for it? Anyway, so that's, that's, the, that's the case from Hawaii. These are two really, really good words uh, unable and block altitude. Uh, I was given the clerks one night, and he said, uh, descend to, from 5,000 to 3,000, reduce air speed to 120 knots. I said, partner, I can go down or I can slow down, but I can't do both at the same time. Which do you want? And so that's, I think you have to say, if you can't do it, just say, I can't do it, unable, and let them make some other arrangements. If you're in turbulence and you're IFR, don't forget now, more than 200 feet, snitch is going to go off. So ask for a block altitude. That alerts them to the fact that you know you're in turbulence, you cannot maintain your altitude, put it on the tape. Block altitude. Huh? Yeah. The, the clearance is in general. Is it not true that the clearance isn't binding until you get set to it? That's true. Yeah, I think that's right. So if he says you're clear to something. If, if he tells you you're clear to do something and you, you say unable or you just don't acknowledge, if you haven't read it back and accepted it, is it, is it true that it's not binding? Yeah, I, I think I need to go stand by or unable. If I wasn't sure I could do it or not, my first response would be stand by. And if I knew I couldn't do it, I'd say I'm able. But, and ATC is not necessarily malicious, but they will put you in a box. They'll put you in a box you can't get out of. And they will ask you to do something, and you, if you accept that clearance, you're going to bend your airplane or commit a violation, so don't, don't accept the clearance. I mean, these mini controllers are not pilots. They don't know what you cannot, what you can and can't do in an airplane. Alan? Yeah. I'd like to make a statement on that. If there's something of my own, I flew for Eastern Airlines for 28 years, I had 43 years of security. But, uh, I took off out of 
had a wall he had to wait on the ground in Baltimore, the one up north to uh, Kennedy, and it was a uh, big 